Good afternoon. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. It. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I will uh, maximize it now. Okay, perfect. So, yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Karina Ivashku. I'm a PhD student in computer science at the University of Exeter. Uh, I'm supervised by professors Richard Everson and Jonathan Fieldson. And today we will present you our work entitled Optimizing Diversity in Classifier Ensembles of Classification Tree. So first of all, what are ensembles? Ensembles are a collection of predictors that usually have better generalization performance than individual predictors. Uh, we have defined the ensemble prediction by using majority voting, as we can see from this block here. Uh, with the following notations, M is the number of classifiers, YIN is the prediction of the ith classifier for the nth pattern, and CI are the non-negative weights of the classifiers. Uh, we are particularly interested in this term here, denoted by curly YN, which is the set of the outputs of the constituent classifiers for the nth pattern. We will analyze the diversity of this set. I will present it a bit later. Um, so it is well known that an accurate ensemble requires accurate members. However, it was also been proven by Kroch and Veldesby in their work that an ensemble with good generalization performance consists also of diverse members. Uh, but, and so we can conclude that accuracy and diversity are key factors in building a successful ensemble. However, there is a trade-off between accuracy and diversity. As we can see from this plot over here, we can see that in most cases, the most accurate ensembles are not necessarily the most diverse and vice versa. Uh, even though the role of diversity has long been recognized, there have been several methods of several ways of quantifying diversity proposed. Uh, Kancheva and Whittaker in one of their papers, they uh, studied the impact or the influence that diversity has on generalization error. However, their results could not prove this fact. Um, this was partially explained by Chen in his PhD thesis, uh, in which he claimed that different diversity measures have different uh, correlations, degrees of correlation with the generalization error. He studied a set of diversity measures, and amongst all of them, he concluded that there was one that had the strongest negative correlation with the generalization error, and that diversity measure was called ambiguity. It was first defined by Kroch and Veldesby, but for regression ensembles, and satisfied this equation over here. A small parenthesis, uh, this equation also proves once more the usefulness of uh, ensembles. Since the diversity term is usually, well, should be positive, we can see from this equation that the ensemble error should be less than the average error of the individual classifiers. Um, also, Chen uh, followed the same technique as Kroch and Veldesby and defined another ambiguity measure, but for classifiers, and by using the zero-one loss. Uh, we follow the same route, and we define other ambiguity measures for different losses. And from now on, when we refer to ambiguity, it will be equivalent to uh, referring to a diversity measure or a way of quantifying diversity. So the first ambiguity measure that we defined was derived from the log loss and it has the following expression over here with the notations on the right. And uh, it has the following properties. It's zero if and only if all the classifiers agree in their predictions. And it also has the property of being always positive, which is great. Um, next, we will present the ambiguity measure presented by Chen. Uh, so the one derived from the zero one loss with this de definition over here. Uh, so again, this ambiguity measure is zero if and only if the classifiers agree in their predictions. However, we find that this diversity measure or this ambiguity could be negative if the ensemble uh, misclassifies a pattern, uh, which is not desirable. And of course it's opposed to the previous ambiguity measure that we presented that we show that it's always positive. Okay, following, oh, sorry. <laughs> following the same route, we defined another ambiguity measure for the hinge loss. Um, this measure, again, is positive, always. Um, if the classifiers agree in their predictions, then we will have that the ambiguity is zero. However, the converse is not always true. 
So if ambiguity is zero, that does not necessarily mean that all the classifiers predict the same class. Um, this occurs when this quantity over here, so one minus Tn times Yin is positive. And this can be satisfied uh, in, uh, simultaneously by uh, several cases. For example, if, so for the hinge loss, the classes considered are plus and minus one. For example, we can have one classifier that misclassifies the pattern Tn. So in which case this product over here will be negative. So again, this, uh, this term will be positive. But in the same time, we can have other classifiers that correctly predict the pattern, uh, but with the score, so the YIN score to be an absolute value lower uh, or equal than one. So again, in this scenario, we will have again that this term is positive, but one classifier misclassifies the pattern, whereas the others uh, correctly classified. Uh, Chen, in his work, he claimed that there is a negative correlation between ambiguity and generalization error. Uh, however, this cannot be true for the entire range of ambiguity, because this would mean that the maximally diverse ensemble uh, would also minimize the generalization error. But we know that the maximally diverse ensemble could be formed out of random predictors with no predictive power at all. So uh, we decided to analyze the correlation between ambiguity and generalization error. Uh, we ensure diversity also by bagging. So we considered uh, party sampling rates. And for each of them, we generated uh, ensembles, 100 ensembles. We calculated for those the test error and the training ambiguity, uh, one minor uh, remark, so the ambiguity derived from the log loss. We averaged those values and we plotted uh, here um, the corresponding test error and training ambiguity and the, the sampling rates of those particular ensembles. The red one denotes the optimal sampling rate, the one that would yield the lowest test error. So we, we've done this process for two types of ensembles, well, forests, because we're using uh, decision trees. So one was for forests um, made out of five trees and one for 100 trees. Uh, they both uh, show the same uh, behavior. For example, uh, we can see here that uh, by increasing the sampling rate, uh, we have negative correlation between the test error and the training ambiguity. This could be explained by the following fact. So by increasing the sampling rate, the classifiers will become less and less diverse. However, by providing them with more data, that does not necessarily mean that they will become more accurate. So if we go back to the equation that all ambiguity measures satisfy, uh, we can see that since the diversity is decreasing and the average error is approximately constant, the ensemble error will increase. As we can see from the plots here, the ensemble error increases. Uh, conversely, if we decrease the sampling rate, that will lead to a higher diversity. But if we keep decreasing after a certain threshold, the classifiers will become more and more inaccurate. So their average error will increase much faster than the diversity, leading again to an increase of the test error, as we can see here. Uh, from these two plots, we can see uh, how difficult and if it's not almost impossible to uh, predict from the training ambiguity, the optimal sampling rate that would yield the test error. As, as such, we, will, uh, we have designed an evolutionary algorithm to determine this optimal sampling rate. Also, uh, another important remark, which we can uh, make out of these two plots, uh, is that we would consider uh, initially that um, the optimal sampling rate could be around one over M, M being the number of classifiers or trees. As, uh, as a result, every classifier would be trained on n over m uh, examples and being the total number of patterns. So that would mean that on average, each pattern could be used in the training process of at least one classifier. However, we can see from these plots that the sampling rate is way below, well below one over m, which proves uh, once more the significance that diversity has in decreasing the generalization error. So we can 
conclude that it's better uh, to enhance diversity by exposing the classifiers to different views of the data than to better train them by providing them with more data. Uh, next, we analyze the variation of the generalization error with the ensemble size and also the variation of the training ambiguity. Um, so we generated ensembles with a number of classifiers uh, ranging between two to 100. Um, we, we did this again by using bagging, so for given sampling rates. Uh, we averaged, um, so we did this for 20 times, 20 we did 20 repeats, and then we averaged the corresponding generalization error and the training ambiguity and produced the following two contour plots. Uh, in the one in the left, we can see uh, the benefit of using a large ensemble because we can see, so here's the size of, of the ensemble, we can see that the optimum generalization error is achieved for a wide range of sampling rates. If we look at the second plot, the one uh, for the training ambiguity, um, we can see that provided that we do not have a very, very low sampling rate, we can achieve high ambiguity that will also yield low test error. However, once more, these two plots show the difficulty of predicting from the training ambiguity the optimal sampling rate. Uh, as mentioned before, we um, designed the NEA, an evolutionary algorithm, to obtain the optimal sampling rate. So, uh, to reiterate, uh, by having high ambiguity, we can also achieve lower generalization error, provided that the sampling rate is not too low. Uh, as such, our uh, evolutionary algorithm maximizes the training ambiguity. We're actually evolving the training patterns in order to maximize the ambiguity. So we consider forests of M trees, each of them being trained on the same fraction R of the available N patterns. Um, at each generation, we randomly generate a number between one, uh, one and M trees to be modified. So what does this mean? Uh, each tree has assigned a string of zero and ones with the following meaning. If we have one on the ith position, that would mean that the ith pattern is used in the, class of, in the training of that particular tree. Zero means that it's not. So by modifying the tree, we mean that we mutate these strings of zero and ones in order to keep the same sampling rate, so the same number of ones, let's say. Okay, these new trees will replace the older trees and form a new forest. We will evaluate the uh, ambiguity of this new forest. If it's higher than the previous one, than the original one, let's say, at that current generation, um, then we will keep it. In case of equality, we will choose the forest with the lower training error. Um, as, uh, as we've seen in the previous contour plots, we saw the benefit of a large ensemble and we could see that the generalization error was low enough. As a result, we decided to focus on small ensembles. That's why we used ensembles of five trees. Uh, we uh, partitioned the data into training, validation, and uh, test. We used the sa following sampling rates. We ran the e evolutionary algorithm 30 times for each of these rates. And for each of these following data sets, uh, most of them can be uh, found on the UCI machine learning repository. Um, so the EA was run on the training data and the resulting ensemble uh, was evaluated on the validation data. The forest with the sampling rate that yielded the lowest validation error was afterwards uh, evaluated on test data in order to assess the algorithm's performance. So we compared the validation error of the initial population with the validation error of the final population. The green dashed line represents the mean validation error for the initial population, whereas the final one represents the mean validation error for the final population. Uh, the blue box plot represents the test error for the initial population, whereas the red one for the final population. Again, these box plots were only generated for the sampling rates that yielded the lowest validation error. Um, as we can see from this plot, uh, the EA has decreased the generalization error of the ensemble, a fact which was encountered in all the data sets that we use, not just for the liver. <laughs> oh, apologies. Uh, we tried to um, 
calculate the significant this uh, not the statistical difference sorry between our results to see if they are uh, correct um, we used a non-parametric statistical test we used the wilcoxon um, signed rank two tailed test um, so here in this uh, table we have uh, shown the mean test error for the initial population and the mean test error of the final population, but just for the forest that had the sampling rate that yielded the lowest validation error. Uh, the bold means significant difference and the values in the brackets denote the 25th and the 75th quartile. Uh, as we can see from this table, uh, the EA performs uh, better than the um, random sampling from the initial population and never worse. In our evolutionary algorithm, we evolved the training patterns in order to maximize ambiguity. Uh, as such, we thought it would be interesting to uh, see what kind of patterns were actually chosen, what particularities do they have. So we designed a preliminary experiment. We used a two-dimensional data set called GMM5, uh, which the data distribution was known and uh, which we had access to the uh, posterior probabilities. We uh, plotted the patterns uh, selected by the final generation along with their frequency of appearance. We characterized the patterns according to their distance from the decision boundary. The distance was calculated by using the maximum posterior probability of each pattern belonging to each of the two classes. So this is a two class problem. Um, the patterns belonging to the decision boundary would have a maximum posterior probability of 0.5. Um, and as mentioned, we plotted the maximum posterior probability. We have it on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the number of occurrences. Uh, we divided these posterior probabilities into, into 20 bins. And the green dashed lines represent the medians of the number of occurrences of those patterns belonging to each bin. Uh, from this plot, we can see that actually there is no preference of a certain type of patterns and there is no correlation whether a pattern is chosen and its proximity to the decision boundary. Uh, this is uh, contrary to it, what we believed a priori, that the patterns closer to the decision boundary would be preferred since they offer more information about bracketing the boundary. Um, in conclusion, we we defined two new ambiguity measures and we characterized three of them, uh, including the one defined by Chen. Um, the ambiguity derived from the log loss is the only one that has the, all the desirable characteristics of a diversity measure. So being always positive and being zero if and only if the classifiers agree in their predictions. Uh, one important fact to uh, remember to remark is that the generalization error is negatively correlated with diversity at high sampling rates and positively correlated at low sampling rates. Uh, we found that by optimizing the training ambiguity, the one derived from the log loss or cross entropy, um, we would obtain a lower generalization error. And also that there is no correlation between whether a pattern is selected and its proximity to the decision boundary. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Karina, for your presentation. So again, we have plenty of time for questions. So please go ahead. Come on, don't be shy. Oh, Ale, please. Yeah, thank you for an interesting uh, talk. I guess uh, um, uh, uh, I have to admit, uh, and it's probably my, my fault, you know, I'll, 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 uh, I'll reveal that. But at some point, I got a little bit lost here because the, the title of the paper was something like uh, diversity and, and uh, you know, uh, evolutionary algorithms and machine learning and so forth. And then all of a sudden, this is, uh, topic of ambiguity showed up, which sounds, you know, like it's quite interesting. There's also something I haven't come across that much in, in the literature and in my own research. So I think 
And maybe, I mean, uh, uh, I've been around for a while, I have to admit. So I'm guessing this, how business ambiguity could potentially be interesting and how it relates to diversity and, and so forth. That's sort of my sort of high level comment or question. So how does the ambiguity relate to the diversity? Would be a concrete question if you want to have a concrete question to think about. Yes, well, actually, uh, actually, the ambiguity is a type of diversity. So it also measures uh, how, for example, if we have a look at the one derived from the zero one loss, here we have the ensemble prediction and here we have the predictions of the individual classifiers. So we, in this formula, we can see that this ambiguity measure or diversity measure uh, measures how diverse the predictions of the classifier, the members of the ensemble differ from the ensemble prediction. So it is a way of quantifying how diverse they are in between them. So as uh, I, I think I mentioned at some point that um, ambiguity is a way of defining diversity. It's a type of diversity in the end, but it's just called ambiguity. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, yeah, no, it's, that's interesting. It looks like it's in the this, uh, sort of a fitness space or objective space as opposed to... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, so brain. phenotype space, if you will, rather than genotype space, if yes. you want to use that. Yes, vocabulary. yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Rui, uh, I believe you have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. This is a very interesting presentation. Um, I had a question. Um, maybe you explained this, and I, I must have missed it. But but at the end, you said that there was a particular case. I think with the low sampling rate, um, where diversity is actually positively correlated with um, generalization error. Yes. So I, I found that a little weird. Um, so wh why do you think that is? Ah, here, here you mean, yes. So this is because um, if, you pro if you give the classifiers not enough data, they will become less and less accurate. So they will not give a good uh, model. They'll not be a good model. So um, if we have a look at the equation from the beginning, so this one, so this equation actually is satisfied by all ambiguity measures and we actually, um, we use this equation in order to define all the ambiguity measures. So we just use a different uh, loss and we obtain the diversity from this equation, diversity or ambiguity. So um, going back to your question. So since the sampling rates will become more and more smaller, okay, of course the diversity will increase. However, they will become very, very inaccurate. And the average error of, so of, their, of the classifiers will become much higher, will increase much faster than the diversity, so that will lead to an increase in the ensemble error. Okay, yeah, makes yeah. Sense. <laughs> that make, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So obviously there is this trade-off between yes. accuracy and diversity. Yes, and that, that was the problem because we couldn't find a priori that optimal sampling rate, so the knee of the curve, so where, uh, where it changes the correlation, you see. Here mm -hmm. it was negative and here it started being positive. It was difficult a priori to determine it. So that's why we used an EA. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So any more questions? No, actually I, I have a question. It, uh, something that just came up to, to, to my mind right now. So probably doesn't make much sense, but I am going to ask it anyway. Does. And sorry if it's stupid, your diversity measure is in some sense um, sensitive to, 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 to the amount of, of data points. So you just says as, as you lower the number of samples, diversity naturally increases. Yes. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, it's a, you don't have to, to, to to, to answer, but shouldn't a diversity measure be, or, or should I say, robust to that? Because it, it appears a little bit, I, I understand why it happens, but it doesn't sound natural to me. Uh, well, I think uh, probably this is 
the phenomenon, at least in our experiments, when we use sampling rates or bagging. So uh, by having very low sampling rates, that means um, the classifiers will uh, be exposed to a very, very small proportion of the data. So being very, very small, uh, that it's no low. No, okay, I got it. Increase uh, the chances that others classifiers will see a different part of the data. So if we had a very big sampling rate of 0.9, for example, that means most of them will see most of the data, actually. If we have 0.05, it's, it's very likely that the classifier one will see, let's say, the first 5% uh, of the data, okay, next okay. one, the next 5%. So they will not uh, intersect. They will not overlap, so there will be different models. Mm -hmm, That's, mm -hmm. uh, that was our idea, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in, in some sense, you, you are also increasing the standard deviation of the diversity, which adds to, to because you have lower, so you, the standard deviation tends to increase. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Sorry yeah. for, for no, being no, thank dumb. you for your question. <laughs> thank you for your question. No, it was a, it was a brilliant okay. question. So, Same. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. I think, oh, uh, we ran out of time. That's... That's what I get for, for making questions. So 